Dave Rubin is a talk show host, comedian, and TV personality, as many of you know. The host of the popular YouTube talk show, The Rubin Report, Dave regularly addresses big ideas such as free speech, political correctness, and religion. Among many other high-profile guests on his show, Dave has interviewed Sam Harris, Ayan Hirsi Ali, and Larry Elder. And we also have Yaron Brook here tonight. Yaron Brook is the chairman of the board of Ayn Rand Institute, renowned best-selling author and host of the nationally syndicated Yaron Brook Show, which broadcasts live on Blog Talk Radio and YouTube. Brooke is also an internationally sought speaker whose talks promote capitalism, inequality, Ayn Rand, and her philosophy, which uh, you all know to be objectivism. Brooke was born and raised in Israel, served as a first sergeant in the Israeli military intelligence, and earned a Bachelor's of Science in Civil Engineering from the Technion Israel Institute of Technology in Haifa, Israel. He moved to the United States and received his MBA and PhD in Finance from the University of Austin, Texas. The Ayn Rand Institute fosters a growing awareness, understanding, and acceptance of Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism in order to create a culture whose guiding principles are reason, rational self-interest, individualism, and laissez-faire capitalism. Student programs are a major focus of the Institute and include annual essay contests that award nearly $100,000 in prizes, student conferences, student club support, seasonal internships, and campus events. So if you are interested in that, you can visit AynRand.org. And then one more thing, we wanted to give a big thanks to our amazing event photographer, Albert Aronov of Starfall Productions. He is available for graduation pictures, videos, anything of that sort. So at the end of the event, if you'd like to speak to him, right back there. Thank you. I'm Anthony, president of Young Americans for Liberty. And I also want to thank Christina, who's president of Turning Point, also campus coordinator. And Alex from the Euron, uh, from the Ayn Rand Institute. I don't know where Alex is, but uh, without uh, these great minds and these great institutions, we wouldn't be able to put this event on. So you guys know who you came to see. No further ado, Dave and Euron. All right, thank you guys. Uh, you probably heard our, our mics. This is just for the, for the feed, so uh, we're gonna try to talk as loudly as possible. First off, I'm very excited to be here. I just had my first ever police escort to a bathroom. Uh, so I guess that means I've made yep. it. At you've this lived point. now. Now you've lived. Now I've lived. I mean, there are police out there. I, I usually only do these events either with 20 police officers or a former IDF soldier. So uh, we, we've got. Who does both. not know Krav Maga? You do not know Krav Maga. <laughs> yeah. uh -oh, we're in a lot of trouble. All right. Well, thank you guys for for coming out. We're going to talk about big ideas, and we're going to talk about free speech, and we're going to talk about the role of the government. Uh, first off, we are putting this on my YouTube channel. So can you crazy? conservatives, Republicans, objectivists, whatever you consider yourselves. Can you make some noise for the people watching this? Yeah. Home. Yeah. Wow, that was, I'm impressed. All right. Very impressed. Wow, I'm actually shocked. I, I mean, I recognize a lot of you guys from some of the, uh, the events through ARI and, and Turning Point that I've done lately. So it's just amazing to me that for as, as crappy as everything seems on college campus these days, you guys are out here to talk about ideas. Uh, Yaron and I had a, about an hour in the car earlier to, <laughs> to do this. I think we've already given this, the talk to each other. We're really open right now. We're willing to kind of take this in any direction. We're going to try to push and pull on each other a little bit, but we don't really have an agenda here. Uh, but I think originally this was set up to be about, about limited government. Uh, which is one of your big things. Yep, so I'll, yep. I'll let you kick it off and then we'll see. But we want you guys to interact. We're going to do about 45 minutes of us talking and then we're going to do uh, questions totally uncensored from you guys. So, uh, Yaron, take it away. Sure. And, and I'm going to swivel a little bit because you're all over the place. So, um, yeah, the role of government. So, you know, we were talking in the car uh, coming in here on one of the interviews that Dave has done recently with Steven Pinker. And I don't know if you've read his latest book, Enlightenment Now. Let me just endorse it right now. You know, there's things I disagree in the book, but the book is phenomenal, and everybody, everybody on the planet should be reading this book. He's endorsing a big lefty, by the way. Yeah, so that's big lefty, idea. right? Yeah. And one of the things that Pinker identifies is he, he, he goes through a whole series of chapters where he tells us how good life is right now on planet Earth. It's never been better. And he's, he's absolutely right. Life expectancy, poverty rates, uh, hunger, all of these things. We're in a better situation today than we've ever been before. And he identifies the cause of that. And the cause, he says, is basically human ingenuity, ideas. 
the application of human reason in solving problems. Now, how is this related to the role of government? Because you ask yourself, what kind of environment allows for the thriving of human reason? What kind of environment allows for ideas not just to be thought of, but then implemented in reality and brought into existence? And what you realize quickly, and if you study the history, this is exactly what happened, is that for ideas, for people to come up with ideas, for people then to implement the ideas, to, to, to make them a reality, they need to be free. They need to be free. You can't have it when the Catholic Church is telling you, oh, no, no, the sun goes around the earth, it doesn't work the other way around. You, you can't have it when some autocrat tells you what to think or what to do, what business you can open or what business you can't open. You need to be free. Free to think sometimes ridiculous ideas that fail, but then you fail. That's okay. But for the successful ideas to work, people have to have the freedom to try them and to go out and do them. And then, so freedom of what, right? Because freedom is a word everybody loves, right? Nobody's against freedom, right? But freedom from what? Well, freedom means freedom from coercion, freedom from force, freedom from authority. And if you think about what that means, it really is the concept that the Founding Fathers described as individual rights. Rights really are the recognition that each individual is, should be free, free from coercion, free to live their life as they see fit, free to think and to speak and to act as they see fit, as long as they're not harming other people. They have the right to pursue the rational values necessary for their own existence in their life. And therefore, what the only role of government, as I see it, is to make that freedom a reality. And to make that freedom a reality, what we need is to, is to extract force when we get together to, to make sure that you guys, you know, this is why we have the police here, right? Don't attack me because of what I'm saying. Right. That's it. So we need freedom from force. So the role of government is basically that. It's to guarantee that we can say what we want to say, do what we want to do, and otherwise leave us alone. So police, a military, and the judiciary. And that kind of environment is what fosters the kind of creativity that is made and, and the, 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 the production that has made this world such an amazing world. Right? So, yeah, it, it, it's, it's simple. So right? I love that one of the things he said there was freedom to think because you guys are in college. This is where you're supposed to learn how to think. And unfortunately, what's happening, obviously, on most college campuses these days is that thinking is sort of becoming uh, an outlier in, in what's going on. So it's interesting. He references, your own references, Steven Pinker's book. Steven Pinker, again, as I said, he's a lefty. I think he would probably say he's a progressive who would disagree with you on virtually every political topic. And that's what I think is so cool about what's happening these days. And I think it's probably why you guys watch my show or you're involved in, in this whole thing that's happening right now. The, the, the example I like is if you take two guys that I'm sure you guys are familiar with, Ben Shapiro and Sam Harris. These guys disagree on literally every political topic there is from, forget political topic, they disagree on the most existential <laughs> questions of the universe, right? Whether, whether God exists and the value of religion to abortion, to taxes, to, to literally just down the line, what, whatever you, ta the whole thing. Yet they're allies now because there is a massive realignment happening that if you will agree on defending free speech, defending someone's ability to think and live their life for themselves, that in a pluralistic society, we're actually supposed to disagree on those things. So I, I think that's a beautiful thing right there. But unfortunately, we're, we're sort of only seeing tolerance one way these days. Yeah, and, and, and the, the beauty of this alliance is, is two things. One is this idea of freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of thought. But the second is that the standard for truth is reason that reason is the way in which we communicate, reason is the way in which we deal with one another. It, you know, it's not my God versus your God and my revelation versus your revelation. No, even if you're religious, like let's say Jordan Peterson maybe is, nobody's actually sure. Yeah. Maybe, even Jordan, <laughs> maybe even Jordan's not exactly sure. Well, I'm going on tour with him, so yeah, There I'll you go, you'll yeah. find out maybe. Yeah. But, you know, at the end of the day, the standard is reality, the standard is reason. Right? And, and the beauty of Steven Pinker and, and his book is, well, yeah, I think there's some inconsistencies there, some ways in which he abandons reasons, but he venerates the idea of reason, of reality-based 
thinking, of facts. And the same on, on many issues, Ben Shapiro, right? Even when we talk about politics or whether there's a disagreement on politics, we agree that the standard should be what is true, what is actually in reality. But that, that's why I think there's something actually special going on here. I mean, if you look here, right, we've got the Young Americans for Liberty. This is a, a libertarian organization, obviously. Turning Point USA, a lot of their, their main guys are Trump supporters. You're, you're not a Trump supporter. Uh, that's I, an understatement. Yeah. Uh, that's an understatement. <laughs> I voted for Gary Johnson, and I should be judged accordingly. I mean... <laughs> Gary Johnson, by the way, he is the first person that actually ever made me question whether weed should be legal or not because <laughs> the man could not remember anything. Um, it's true. But, but this shows you that there's a diversity of idea happening right now on what I would say is basically the sort of center right, yep. basically. That I, we could get into some of our political differences, I'm happy to do that, but that you guys are here and that no matter what we say right now, you came because you wanted to hear about some diverse ideas. And unfortunately, I, you know, I offer this all the time. I, my next six months, year basically, is full with speaking gigs. Uh, and not one is from a, a Democrat organization or a left organization or a progressive organization. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm gay married. That should have, I'm not even gay, I just did it for the cred, but. Um, <laughs> But that should have some cred with these people. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pro-choice. Uh, you know, we could go down the list. I'm for some social safety net that I know yep. we disagree yep. on. Plenty of those things that should get me some cred with the left. But unfortunately, there, there's a real corruption in, there, in the side that is always preaching about tolerance. And what I'm finding, and I find it more and more, is I talk to these people who I have massive disagreements with. I, I'm sure some of you guys saw uh, Ben Shapiro on my show where we, we disagreed about uh, abortion and the death penalty and a bunch of other things, but yet you guys invite us here. So that actually does say something. That's a, that's a real credit to you, uh, and, and we just aren't seeing this on the left. Do you think it was always like this on the left? Because no, it's new, I, I think, for young people, yeah. and even for me, it was it's yeah. sort of new. I don't think it was always like this on the left. I think the left was better in the past. I think, I think the left, indeed, in many respects, the left was better than the right on the issue of free speech. And the right was actually oppressive of free speech for a very long time. So you're talking and, about Berkeley 30 years Yeah, I mean, ago. suddenly if you go back to the 60s, and so, but, but since then and, and, and before the 60s, there was, a, there was definitely a, a sense in which the left was much more open to new ideas. And look, you know, I, I think you're more positive on the right than I am. Yeah. Because, because, you know, so if you went to CPAC this last year, and there was a speaker at CPAC who spoke about, who was from Cato, the Cato Institute, and he said some positive things about immigration. You would think he just said, we should kill all babies or something. The, the room exploded, they booed him, they tried to get him off stage, and many of the people are in that auditorium would have shut him up if they could have done it. So I think, I think we, we're a little too, uh, you know, too positive about the, some people on the right. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I was at an event just before the election in Chicago, and this was, this was like, everybody was over 65. It was like a tea party group. And I was on stage, and I said something positive about immigration. I, I'm very positive about immigration. You can ask about that. And oh my God, these 65-year-olds were standing up and, and cursing me and yelling at me and trying to get me off the stage. So there's a sudden intolerance, unfortunately. Uh, it, you know, I think it dominates the left, and it's in certain parts of the right on certain issues. And it's, it's scary. Because, because again, I mean, I think this group realizes this. Once you lose the ability to speak, they're basically, once, you, once you're silenced, they're basically limiting what you can think. And once you do that, then we're right for authoritarianism. It really is the end of what we call Western civilization, which I think America is still the beacon of, or still struggling to remain the beacon of. It, it, this is the issue of our time. There's no more important issue. And this is why this coalition has come together. Yeah. It's because this is the most important issue I can think of is the issue of free speech. It, it trumps immigration, welfare, politics, any of these other issues. If you can't speak, then you can't think. And if you can't think, it's over. I'm curious, how many of you guys saw just in the last couple of weeks the amount of articles from Vox and Salon and, and all the usual players who were sort of mocking the, the free speech fighters. Did you guys see that? Do you, you know, we'll do, we'll do some of this by applause just so the people at home can get it. Did you, did you guys see those articles? Yeah. 
I know you don't want to applaud those articles specifically. Uh, so that, that, that was a little weird, I suppose. Um, uh, but I thought that was really interesting that suddenly, and these, again, yeah. and you may be right that I've been a yeah. little too easy on, on elements of, yeah. the, of, the, of the right when it comes to, you know, I, for me, it's like I come from the left. So when I see the right, <laughs> when I see these, the race realists or these people that want America to be a white state, or, to, to me, that is so ridiculous. And they have no institutional power and they're, they're a bunch of true racists not the way that racism is thrown at you guys or at us. Yeah. Uh, so to me, those people aren't even worth thinking about or even, it, it's just irrelevant. So but perhaps you, you may be right that I've, I've given them a little bit of a slide there, but what I would say is it's interesting to me that suddenly in the last couple of weeks, there's been this push on the left media to mock the free speech people, the yep. very people who will defend these ridiculous <laughs> organizations like Salon and, and Vox to, to print these usually awful things. Uh, I'm sure many of you guys saw the articles written about Jordan Peterson in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, everyone's well, nodding. And it's like, yeah, I mean, we'll, I find we'll, if, we'll defend their right yeah, to do it. Absolutely. I mean, that's the irony. Abs on the barricades. I mean, literally on the barricades. And, you know, I find it interesting that they, they get microaggressed, I guess, or, or, or they find <laughs> offensive. Yeah certain things that we say. Yeah. Oh, by the and way, yet, we, we have a room of puppies in case yeah. any of you are <laughs> offended by any of the hate speech up here tonight. And cuddly teddy bears, just in yeah, case yeah. something live scares you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like a puppy. <laughs> but, you know, but they can, they can go after Jordan Peterson, offend him, misrepresent him, or misrepresent Ayn Rand, or misrepresent me, and we're not, we, we don't, we, we, I get aggressed. I mean, I get, you know, I get triggered. And nobody cares, <laughs> right? What about me, right? Yeah. You can insult me and there's like, if I say something on, about, about them, oh my God, they're so sensitive, but they feel complete, no problem, insulting and, and really being violent yeah. against us and we're supposed to just take it. Now, let me just say something about this left-right. I think one of the reasons I'm sensitive uh, in, in terms of more critical of the right is because I'm perceived as a member of the right and Ayn Rand is perceived as, a, as, as belonging on the right. And, and, my, and, and I don't want to be, I don't want to be associated with Donald Trump. I don't want to be associated with some people on the right. So when people write, like Salon does often, uh, Trump's Ayn Rand cabinet, right? I make a special effort to make it clear that there's no relationship between anybody on Trump's cabinet and what Ayn Rand really meant. So I am much more sensitive to the nonsense on the right because people want me to belong there. I don't believe I'm on the left or on the right. I, you know, I think we're like on a, on a slightly different <laughs> dimension. Yeah. So I'm, I'm clearly much more sensitive about the right. And I also think, I mean, that's a whole other question. I also think the right, there's a certain danger there as well. But. Yeah, all right, so, and I also, you know, as I'm sure many of you guys have seen, I think these labels are getting yep. increasingly meaningless left, right. I, I'm sure if we polled all of you guys that your political opinions would be all over the place, and that's what it's supposed to be. That is what freedom is supposed to be. It's not supposed to be ingrained into a political party. But as I saw all these articles about, about free speech and, and, you know, they were supposedly putting out polls that you know, students are more tolerant than ever. And then if you actually read them, it was that they were just intolerant of racist speech, which of course is insane because they label everything they don't like racist. So uh, it doesn't quite work. But just by, again, by applause, which is a little bizarre, how, how many of you on campus here have been afraid to either say what you think politically to a friend or a faculty member or in class or anything like that? I know it's a weird thing to applaud. Wow, wow. Yeah, I got to figure out a better, but something else. Should it be booze for that? What should I? Yeah, do? booze is good. Yeah, booze is good. Uh, but but that right there shows it. I mean, I don't think the same thing is if we were, if I was invited again, if there uh, yeah. was a progressive group that would invite us here, your own and I would be happy to do it. And I think if I asked them, you know, how many of you guys have been afraid to share your opinions? Uh, on intersectionality or third wave yeah. feminism or whatever else it is, I'm pretty sure none of them uh, are having that issue. And so actually, that, that shows the, the right survey now. showed that. The survey they were all quoting says that uh, people on the left don't believe that there's any problem for them to express themselves, but they do recognize that conservatives or anybody on the right do have a problem expressing themselves. So the survey showed exactly this. But what was interesting is the way the survey was phrased. It was, what do, you, what do you see as more important, free speech or diversity and, and uh, diversity and something else? And, uh, you know, Inclu inclusion, inclusion, diversity yeah. and inclusion. 
first of all, setting those two against each other. Yeah. What does diversity and inclusion even mean? Define your terms, right? And then to set it up against free speech, and there a majority said diversity and inclusion are more important than free speech, which is shocking. Right. And also just think what the, you know, I, I know many of you guys know this, but just think about what they mean by diversity. Yeah. I could look around this room, I see a diverse yeah. <laughs> group of people in color and probably sexuality and ethnicity and religion and all of that stuff. How many of you, I mean, is there anyone here that wants to be judged by that, your, your sexuality or your color or your religion? I mean, religion's not an immutable characteristic, but they've sort of dragged it as one. I'll judge uh, them based uh, on their religion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm the atheist in the room. Yeah, well, I'll yeah, judge them. There you them. go. <laughs> a, I mean, there you go again. So, okay, so we have, we have an atheist. I mean, I think generally conservative, there's an idea that conservatives uh, aren't that happy with atheists. But again, you are invited to yeah. all of these yeah. places. Yeah. So this actually is what diversity is all about. But, but shifting from that a little bit, yeah. um, let, let's do some hot button things. Because sure. we touch on them a little bit in the sure. car. The, the gun thing is big, obviously, yep. right now. So, yep. you know, there was the Parkland shooting. It's horrific. You know, just watching what's happening on Twitter now where they're taking all of these kids and, and that's what they are, they're kids. And they've suddenly become leaders of a movement on both sides. And I think regardless of what your feelings are about guns, I think there's an absolute danger in having uh, young people who don't have a full handle on the issues who've experienced something horrible, but that doesn't make you an authority on how legally we should be, be guiding ourselves. Uh, but the gun issue seems to have trumped everything else at this point. Trumped even Trump at well, this point. Yeah. I mean, two things. One is relating to the, 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 the young people. I mean, you guys have all grown up in an educational system that has told you that what you should value are your emotions and how you feel. You've gotten ribbons for coming in last or whatever, right? Um, <laughs> It's not to hurt your self-esteem or anything. I, I can't even say coming in last. There is no first There's and no last. last. There, is, there is no. Um, and, and what we're seeing today is exactly a reflection of that. As adults, we are now venerating the emotions of 16-year-olds. Now, it, they have emotions, and, and it's true, but what are the facts? What is the data? What, what, are the, what are the rights issues involved? Let's have a real conversation about it. And I get in trouble when I talk about guns, and including within the objectivist community. A lot of people uh, disagree with me violently about guns. I'm not a big fan of guns. Um, I'm a, I, you know, this is from a former IDF guy who, who used a lot of big guns. Uh, I think you have a right to certain guns, but I don't think you have a right to any kind of gun. And a discussion about that, right, and a real discussion about what are the issues and how do you decide, that isn't happening, right? So on the one side, you get the people who say, no, you know, it, it, it's, you know, it's a Second Amendment that I get my AR-15 or whatever, right? And, and what about the tank and what about the other stuff? You know, where is the line? Nobody wants to have the discussion of what is the line, right? And then you have the other side, oh, ban everything. And there's no actual discussion about what is the role of government? Is there a role of government? If there is a role of government, I think there is a role of government because we're talking about violence, we're talking about weapons, we're talking about things that are built for the purpose of violence. How do we have, and, and I don't have the answers. I actually, this is one of those issues where I don't have a clear, usually I'm like, this is it. Yeah. I don't have a clear answer on the guns, but I, I know that it's an interesting conversation to have and there are a lot of deep issues to be discussed. And I don't see any of that conversation happening out there. So I, I, was, I was pulling out my phone, not because I was going to tweet while you were talking, but, but somebody tweeted something at me on the way here, actually, that I thought was really interesting because I, I sent out a couple of tweets on guns. Uh, and he wrote, people generally don't understand why Second Amendment absolutists fight against almost all gun regulations. In a vacuum, they may even think that some of those regulations are appropriate. But in a context where you know the opposition will keep pushing for more, you have little choice but to stand your ground. And, and I really thought that captured it for me because I'm not a huge gun guy in general. I mean, the two yeah. places I've lived in my life basically are New York City and L.A. I mean, I'm, I'm around liberals and not around <laughs> a lot of gun people. I, you know, it, this isn't, it's not even one of the issues. It's becoming a pet issue of mine because it's so important sure. right now. Uh, but this isn't something that I've, I've you know, talked about in a, in a really broad sense. But I thought that position was interesting, that knowing the way people operate now, that if you give an inch, they will take a mile. And, I, and I'm sure some of you guys saw at the, uh, at the rally the other day in D.C. 
one of the, the survivors was giving a speech, young girl, and she basically said, we're gonna start with bump stocks and then we're gonna keep going. In effect, we're gonna keep going till all guns are banned. And I thought, that is how these people operate. And now they're openly saying it too. And I know that's not a position to say, well, I can't negotiate. That's not an ethical position to say I can't negotiate. Um, but it's a, it, it's a real one. It's a real issue. And, and, but that represents one of the great challenges we have in our society where you, you can't have a conversation, right? And if you can't have a conversation, what are we doing, right? And if you can't have a conversation about guns and you can't come up with a reasoned argument about guns, then what are we doing, right? I mean, that's just one issue. And I don't think that's any different than a discussion about, about a thousand other issues that are out there where people cannot have a conversation. So, so what's happening is we're becoming tribal, right? There's the gun guys who are all gonna get together and they're gonna be radical you know, all the way because they don't wanna give an inch because if they give an inch, something will happen. And then there's the anti-gun people and that's it. And, and, and where do we go from that perspective? What is Again, I think what loses is reason. What loses is, is the ability to actually have a discussion about an issue and think about it thoroughly and deeply. And we're becoming tribal on, on almost everything, right? It's, it's what are these guys, you know, I belong to this group and they belong to that group and, and they, they, no, no conversation. Now, look, there's certain issues where I am, I'm gonna stick 100% in my position, but it's not because, um, it's not because I would moderate that position if I thought the other side. No, because I think it's actually true. And I'm not going to stick to a position I know is false because I'm afraid of the other side, you know, forcing me into a compromise. Right. But, because but I think I, that's a I mistake. Think, but a lot of people will. I know. I, you know the well, people that's that, where we are. Yeah. And that's why critical thinking is so important. Because I, even though I understood the, the idea behind that person's tweet, I don't want to be in that position where I start defending things that I don't like just because I hate the other side. Yes. And I think that that's where so many people, uh, so many people happen to be these days. Um, you know what, I'm gonna let you pick the next topic. Because <laughs> we, we said we'd, we'd bounce back and forth. What, what else is on your mind at the moment? Wow, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, right now on my mind is probably, I mean, the thing I talk about mostly right now is trade because of what, because of what, what, what Trump is doing, which I think is, you know, is, is bizarre and absurd and, and ridiculous. So, you know, I don't, I mean, it's not fair because I don't know that you've, you know, you have a position no, can, or thought about it. Yeah, we can. I, but, I, but yeah, go I'm ahead. I'm a YouTuber. Go, I've yeah. thought about almost there you everything. Go. That's right. I mean, come on now. <laughs> it's Dave Rubin. Because he's thought about it. <laughs> I'm sure I can take trade and make it into a demonetization Do it. topic. Do it. Somehow, <laughs> I will be able to. What are the chances we get monetized right now on YouTube? What do you think? We talked about guns, so probably. We, oh, right. Pro so yeah, we're, that, that's we're already, already. We're already. As long as guns are not in the title, but but they, you know they run the algorithms and they find guns and you're yeah. off. So. Well, you know what? Watch, watch. I'll make the move there. I'm curious. How many of you even think that the YouTube situation and the Facebook situation, so demonization, tracking you guys, all that. How many of you think that that actually, maybe second to free speech, as your own laid out, is really the issue of the day? How many of you really think that that's that one? You didn't applaud for, but you all raised your hands. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so a lot of you do think so. So, so I, this is something we disagree. I don't know if yeah. we disagree on. So, no, I think we agree on, but others in our... So, so I think, I think you, what YouTube is doing is awful. I think what Facebook does is awful. I think all that stuff's awful. And I think it's their right to do it. I think it's their property. It's their business. They created it. And if they want to mess it up and they want to screw it up or if they want to exclude me, then they have every right to do that, right? And, and it's up up to us and we, you know, to, to come up with an alternative. To, you know, if, you know uh, uh, I forget who the entrepreneur started YouTube is, but he created something and Google runs it and they own it and they get a set the rules. And if they don't like what we say or they don't want to demonetize it, it hurts, but they have, you know, so I actually think that Prager suing YouTube is really, really bad for the cause of free speech. It muddies the water about what free speech really is. It, it, it takes away this differentiation between what is public and what is private. So I, I'm with your own on that. And I, you guys, I think, know my feelings about Dennis Prager. I, I love Dennis. Yeah. Have, you, have you ever done any events with him? I mean, he no, gladly. No, no. All right, well, let's see if we can make that happen. I'll yeah, see if I can. That'll be guess. interesting. All right, that'll be I, interesting. I, I, I'd love to facilitate that, though, and I, and I think I probably can. I did an event years ago with, with we were both on a panel together, and it, yeah. it, it, it got heated very quickly. 
All right, but <laughs> yeah, but that, that, that's what it's all about, right? So I, I agree with your premise there yeah. that these companies can of course do whatever they want. I tweet this constantly and then people no. always say to me, oh, a libertarian who's saying that, why are you complaining? You're not supposed to complain because you don't want government involvement. I say that's actually, the comp you're making the reverse point, of course. You're supposed to use your voice in a free society to hopefully influence these companies. Uh, I feel like I'm gonna, that's going to be the one that I'm going to have to just tweet for the rest of my life till. Uh, till well, and we should stop using Twitter if we're that offended. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if we really think that Twitter's doing something horrible, then the best way is to boycott. I mean, we had this conversation on your show about what to do about the baker, right? So I believe that you should have a right to discriminate uh, uh, about anything, right? And not just t towards gays, but towards people you don't like or anything. No Jews allowed. Is, 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 I think, okay to put up as a sign in your store. I don't think anybody should go into that store. I think we should all boycott, right? Yeah. And I think that's the appropriate way in which we deal with a business that does something you don't like, but they have a right to do it. It's their property. I have a right to invite anybody I want to my home. It's my property, and believe me, I have very strict, or put it this way, my wife has very stringent criteria. <laughs> Yeah. But who gets invited to a home or not? Yeah, I've and, never been invited to your home. Well, you're, you're invited. My wife <laughs> likes you. Yeah, but um, in Puerto Rico now. And yeah. you can ask me about Puerto Rico if you want, But because I live in Puerto Rico now. Um, but he hates taxes. He I hate taxes, yeah. What's going on there? Yeah. So you have a right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, there is. <laughs> First applause we got tonight. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Hating taxes. So... A store, my business, is just an extension of my home. It's mine. That's what it means to have private property. It's mine. And I have a right to do what I want with it, including be stupid and irrational and suicidal and discriminatory and evil and bad, as long as I'm not punching somebody in the nose, even a Nazi. As long as I'm not punching somebody in the nose, I have a right to do it. And the way to deal with that is to boycott those businesses. And ultimately, if we really get to the point where Twitter is... We will boycott Twitter and we'll find a solution. I, I really believe in all of our ingenuity to be able to find ways around these businesses. They will not dominate us. So I have a slightly different uh, point of view on this, but, uh, but I think it's a rich place for a conversation. So look, I, you know, I did my PragerU video and I've talked about why I wouldn't force the government okay. to force the baker to, to make the cake, right? You can get a cake elsewhere. Uh, I would say that you know one of the things that we still have in this country, at least for now, is the foot vote. We, we have states' rights, and if you don't like something that's happening in your state, you can go to another state. This is a beautiful thing. If we, if we did not have that, you'd have to leave the country. Or you can come uh, to Puerto Rico. Or you can go to Puerto Rico. I'm not, do they have any gay bakers in Puerto Rico? I'm not sure. But, well. I don't think they've heard of gay bakers in Puerto <laughs> Probably Rico. Probably not. <laughs> you know? um, but I, I personally would not have the baker, the government force the baker to, f to provide a specific service. Now you're actually taking it a step further because what you're saying is it's not about a specific service. Like in this case, it's a, it's a cake that maybe he doesn't normally make. So that's a specific yeah. service. You're saying actually, if he doesn't want gay people to be in his store, he doesn't have to be. Now we have the Civil Rights Act of, I think 1964. Yep, uh, yep. 64. And that, 63 or 64? 64, right? 64, I think. 64, okay. Yep. It's Johnson. Uh, which that, uh, forced businesses not to discriminate based on, on color and, and several other characteristics. I'm okay with that because at the time there was so much discrimination and so much inequity, yeah. and there were still laws on the books in different states that allowed for it, that this is an odd case where I think the federal government did the right thing, where I think there's an interesting libertarian or objectivist argument to make against that in 2018, which I think is your argument. So I would say that certainly the federal government had a role in 64 to play, and, and I support most of the, of the Civil Rights Act. Um, and they certainly had a responsibility, a moral responsibility, legal responsibility, a constitutional responsibility, to make sure that all the states got rid of whatever discriminatory laws they had. That, that's what the Civil War was about. And if, if 100 years later we still have to fight that battle, it's horrific, right? The federal government has a responsibility to make sure the states are not in a significant way violating individual rights and discriminating by law. But I don't believe the federal government or state government or any government has a right to impose their will on my private property. And even if you could make an argument that you needed a corrective action in 1964, which I don't support, I don't support because I think once you do it, it's a slippery slope and you get the baker. You get, you get these situations. It, it, there's no way to avoid it. 
And not only that, but you get the situation where the government today can tell me who to employ, under what conditions to employ, what, who I can fire, when I can't fire. You know, today there's ageism and there's a million isms that determine who I can fire and hire. You know, I could be sued in California if I fire somebody who's older mm -hmm. because it's ageism or something. You know, so there's no end to that, and that is the slippery slope of the 64 Civil Rights Act. So, I, but even if you assumed, okay, you needed a corrective measure in 64, okay, it's gone. I, enough is enough. And I also think that a lot of the rise of the, um, of the racist right today mm -hmm. um, is a consequence, it's a backlash of the identity politics of the left, which, in, and all of that is institutionalized into the Civil Rights Act. So affirmative action is a racist policy. It's a racist policy, whether it's corrective or not, it's racist. Once you adopt as a federal government a racist policy, then who's to say that racism is not okay you know, on the left and on the right. And what you're seeing is, I think it's legitimized, the rise of a new form of racism that is widespread in this country. Which, by the way, if you guys want to see how this is so, how this actually creeps up into all of these businesses, you know, I'm sure many of you saw this, but Google is now ha has a lawsuit involved because they had a practice of not hiring Asian or white male yeah. engineers. Yeah. That actually is racism. Yeah. You should be hiring people based on whoever's most qualified uh, but you shouldn't be saying we are literally, not, I mean, that is literally what they were going to do. They were not going to hire white males or Asian males. I mean, I can look out here, there are some Asian people. So that means you would be less inclined to get a job because of what you look like. That is actually the definition of racism. So the more this yeah. stuff gets institutionalized, the more we're actually going to see the rise of this identitarian right, and that's what we're trying to yeah. neutralize. And, and of course, there's a identitarian left, and it's, it's all playing off, and I think it really gets legitimized by the 64 uh, uh, Act. And look, Berkeley, Berkeley does the same thing. It, it, it doesn't take more Asians, because I think 40% now of Berkeley is Asians. Yeah. And they've like said, enough, we need diversity. So in the name of diversity, they're taking less qualified students in the name of, of this diversity thing. So, no, I, I, I think, it, I think the, the 64, I mean, I, I supported, I support, I, you know, I was alive then, but very little. So I didn't support Goldwater, but Ayn Rand supported Goldwater. And Goldwater w agreed with most of the civil law rights side, except that portion that, that, that basically intervened in private property and created affirmative action. He was, you know, he was, Goldwater was not a racist, so he, he believed that, you know, we should get rid of any kind of institutionalized racism. But you don't get rid of institutionalized racism by creating reverse institutionalized racism. That just perpetuates the racism problem. I, I feel like we should talk a little bit about how this also crushes creativity. Because I'm sure many of you saw this, Peter Thiel is taking his companies and he's leaving Silicon Valley. He's leaving San Francisco, right? I mean. The guy's worth about $4 billion. He can't even afford to live there anymore. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a real problem. I thought that was funnier, no? Is that, is that, I, thought that was, I thought that was all right. Um, but, but I think what he realized there is that this, this diversity memo that was forcing him yep. to either hire a certain way that wasn't based in qualification, what that will actually do to creativity. I think, I think Ayn Rand certainly had a lot to say about this. So I think well, again, it's, it's freedom. What, what creativity depends on. Is, is, is freedom, it's the, I, it's the idea of coming up with whatever ideas, using your reason, being judged based on the quality of the ideas, based on the truth of the ideas, but not based on the color of your skin, not based on whether you're a woman or a man, not based on any of these irrelevant criteria, but just on the quality of what you are creating. And you can't do that anymore, right? You, you, you can't talk in some of these corporate environments, particularly in Silicon Valley, about anything outside of the box, anything that doesn't fit into some frame of people who call themselves leftist, I guess, who, who, who and, and, and look, I love Silicon Valley in many respects. I think Silicon Valley is the model for America. I mean, they're the hardest working, most creative, most innovative, most exciting people in the planet. But isn't that the irony? It should be a libertarian <sighs> yes, haven, right? Yes, it should be. Or it secretly is, I think, is possible. I think, I think they're more kind of free market, free thinkers in Silicon Valley than give it credit for, but it's this oppressive leftist kind of ideology, particularly on social issues, that does not allow those people to even speak up. Uh, now, 
you know, you know all the Google memo, the demure, uh, you know. Now, I don't necessarily agree with what was written in the memo, but the memo was pretty lame. I mean, it was pretty uninteresting, right? He said some stuff that a lot of evolutionary psychologists that I don't necessarily agree with say. It's, it, this was not radical. It was not crazy. And yet he gets fired for, for writing something that, yeah, it, a lot of people could easily disagree with. But, but that's a great conversation to have about the difference between men and women is a fascinating conversation to have, even as I'm saying this. I'm dreading the idea yeah. of actually having that conversation because yeah. it's so scary, right? Yeah. But it's a, it's a fascinating conversation to have, and you can't have it because there's a dogma that says there are no differences. But, but of course there are differences. Just look around the room. We're different, right? And, and the idea that biological differences don't have manifestations psychologically and in other ways is absurd, right? So, but we can't, you know, if I said that in front of certain audiences, you know, third wave feminism or yeah. whatever, they, they come after me, right? Well, what's even more dangerous about that is that Google asked James to write the memo, in effect. You know, they were all sent to oh. these courses, and they were asked, well, what do you think about this? Let <laughs> us know. And I'm sure, I don't know the numbers, but I would venture to say that 90% of the employees that went to these things probably never did what they were supposed to do. They probably went there, probably were tweeting half the time and went to sleep. And then this guy actually listened. He goes, this is a problem at this company. Yeah. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do, I'm going to respond. He then sent it out privately, by the way. This is one of the biggest misnomers yeah. about this And he wasn't situation. fired when he sent it out privately. No. And then someone else leaked it. He wasn't looking for attention. He, I mean, he did exactly what the company told him to do. I believe this was the end of August. Yeah. By the way, he had just been given a promotion for good work in June. He was fired by, what, October or so? Yeah, he was fired not, because no. of the public pressure on Google. It wasn't even within Google. I mean, some people within Google clearly want him to out. But it was the outcry among, among the, the, you know, the, the people who supposedly count in Silicon Valley, the diversity chiefs at all these organizations, that really got him fired. It, it wasn't even, it, while it was just in Google, nobody seemed to really care. And by the way, did you guys see this other thing a couple months ago? I think it was YouTube, but somebody correct me if I'm wrong. There was a, an Asian woman <coughs> who was hired as the diversity offer, uh, officer for YouTube. Yes. She said that she wanted diversity of thought, and that includes white men, and then she was forced to step down in a yes. week. I She's, mean, really think, was it YouTube? Am she I, am literally I said she wants diversity of thought, and that it, it, she didn't care if it was a man, woman, Asian, black, you know, whatever the thing. She just wanted diversity of thought, and she thought that good thinking wasn't associated with the color of your skin. And... She was fired for that. I think it was YouTube. Yeah. I think it was it, within Google again. Okay, I'm getting, I'm getting a couple nods. Maybe not. No. Oh, it was Apple. It was Apple. Okay, no, you're right. I don't Thank think you it's Apple. No? No, but it, was, it, no? it might not have been YouTube. Anyway, I'm sure the you YouTube can Google commenters it. will be very friendly to us on this error. <laughs> yeah, you know? Somebody is tweeting you right yeah, now they're, they're correcting, always, they're always correcting our mistake. But yeah, it was definitely, she was definitely, that's exactly what she said. And, and she was accused of that. So. There's, a poli there's almost this, this um, and, it, and it's not a majority of people. I mean, I, I, I know lots of people in Silicon Valley who don't believe any of this crap, right? But there is a, it's, a, it's the culturally important people in some way, right, yeah. who, who guide this. And they're intolerant. They're intolerant to any view that does not fit their view of the world. And it's, it's horrific. So um, let's, let, let's shift a little bit. Um, can someone, yeah, where are we at? Just so I know. We've got another... Thing. Six minutes, I Six think. Six minutes Seven or so, minutes. and then we're going to jump right? into Q&A. Yeah. So um, I think the other issue that, that is huge right now, that I think your generation you, gets... You deflected the trade stuff pretty oh, the, well. That, that I noticed pretty good. that. That's good. <laughs> um, um, Thank you. Yeah, You're good on. job. Good yeah. job. Uh, trade, yes, yes. Um, no. So, Boring. Who the hell? Nobody watches. That's why he has I'm hundreds gonna, of thousands of, you know, that's the difference, right? I'm going to do a subtle <laughs> move into something much sexier, which is the crumbling of mainstream media, and we can mock CNN. How about that? There Would that go. be better? <laughs> I'm a crowd pleaser, you know, trade. Yeah, let's talk See, about can trade. I defend, okay. I, can I defend mainstream media for a second? Oh, I, yeah. Go ahead. I mean, so I agree with all the criticism on mainstream media, but the fact is, the fact is, that the only people who actually have reporters out there, the only people who have people out there around the world actually re trying to report news, and many of them don't report news, they report bias, but it is the mainstream media. Now, I think they're horrible and awful, but the fact is 
that in terms of news, not in terms of commentary, there's commentary you have all the options in the world, but in terms of actually knowing what's going on in the world, what's tragic is we have no alternative, right? If you actually want to know what's going on right now in Cairo, nobody other than CNN or the New York Times has anybody there. Uh, and that makes their bias even worse. Because there's, no, and, and the idea of objective journalism, I don't know if anybody here is in journalism school. Nobody, right? <laughs> One guy threw his notebook in the back. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. That was it. Nobody, not a single person. I mean, yeah. almost every school is probably represented here, but journalism yeah. and English maybe is not. Yeah. Um, I mean, they, they're not taught objective reporting. They're not taught that there is such a thing as objective reality. So it's not even that I blame them, I blame their professors who've taught them this garbage. But we don't even actually have information coming in that's reliable. So I actually read all the mainstream media, I have to, because there's no alternative, there's nobody else. Yeah, so Yaron makes a couple of interesting points there. So first, you're right, in terms of reporting, you know, I get people that come up to me, I, I was out once with Ben and somebody came up and said, oh, you're the only, you're, you guys are the only people I trust. And I was like, man, if that's true, we are <laughs> fucked. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we are, you know, like I'm trying, man, yeah. but like I'm but one do guy, I don't have people out in the field in Cairo, you know? Um, although I tweet with a guy in yeah. Cairo, but you know what I'm saying? Like, and what Ben does is commentary for the most part. He doesn't actually Precisely. So give you, you news. Right. So, and, and Ben wouldn't deny that, yeah, by the way. Yeah. I think Daily Wire does a nice job of, of doing news, but I don't know how many people they have on the field, out in the field. Yeah, in somewhat. Places. It, most of it, even that, is, is interpretation. So, right? But this is, this is the strange place we're in. We're now reliant on very few people that are actually doing true reporting and true journalism. There are a couple, by the way. I, I, Tim Poole, who I'm sure some of you guys know, I think is, is one of the best. Um, but... What is now passed as news, you know, I don't watch CNN anymore. Sometimes I put it on yep. mute and I play the Looney Tunes theme song. Um, <laughs> but it, what, what is, every now and again, I'll be at the gym and CNN's on and I just watch with, on mute. But do you watch real. Fox? No, I don't watch any of them. But yes, Fox, I don't watch any way. I mean, Fox is just as bad. But, it's but, just, but ironically, the bias Fox, is that way. However, which, yeah. which is the only yeah. network that'll put either one of us on? It's Fox. Fox won't put me on anymore. Oh, well. <laughs> I mean, I, no, it's I true. I mean, got to me yet. But. I mean, during the elections, they wanted me to endorse a candidate, and I refused. I said I don't like any of them, and, I, and, I, and, and because I wouldn't endorse a candidate. And then in 2012, because I was criticizing Republicans, they literally told me that because I was criticizing Republicans, they would not have me six months before the election. I, I was banned from Fox. So, so what I would say is the reason I focus on CNN more is because yeah. everyone knows oh. what MSNBC is. Everyone knows what Fox yes, is. They're not true. pretending. I'm pretty sure you can look at what network Hannity's on Fair and not going, what are these people about? You know, like, I don't, I don't think it's really like that, right? Yeah. But, but CNN is pretending. Yes. And I think that that's the bigger problem because you can watch virtually any show on CNN and what they're passing as news really is 24-7 Trump hysteria. And I'm obviously sitting next to somebody uh, who shares some of those views, but that they're trying to gin us all up into well, some sort of Well, for very crazy, different reasons, yeah, right? for very different very reasons different reason. there. But, but that they're trying to gin us all up into caring about things that don't matter, uh, as opposed to caring about the things that do matter, which is why you will never see conversations like this on CNN. You, the, the amount of traction that a guy like Jordan Peterson who's get, getting by talking about psychology and telling you to clean your room <laughs> is, it, my room has never been cleaner, by the way, after spending some time with this guy. Um, he still needs to work on me, obviously. Yeah, yeah, you could clean up your room a little. But, but that is what's happening here. There is a disconnect between the people that are supposedly giving you news and what you guys are realizing the truth is. And the and fact that there's about 20 of us that seem to be trying to offer a defense on that is, is actually scary to me. And my, my view is this has been going off a long time. It's just people have just realized it. But, but I remember 20 years ago, CNN was just as biased as it is today. Just people didn't realize it. There wasn't this uh, uh, counter. I, you know, I don't know how many of you ever listened to BBC. The BBC's nutty left. I mean, it's crazy left. But it's the only, again, only news source if you want global news or if you read The Economist. Again, the Economist even is pretty left, but if you want to read about what's going on in Africa, that's the only source there is. And, and the left has dominated the news sources throughout, and they bias. So I listen, I don't watch any television. I, I, I hate television news. I can't stand, I tend to start throwing things. 
Fox, CNN, CNBC, doesn't matter. I, you know, it, there's something visceral about the image. But I listen to NPR. I listen to NPR a, a lot, uh, although in Puerto Rico less so. Um, Pushy, because it's just, you know, in Puerto Rico is just relaxed. You know, who wants to listen to NPR when you're relaxed? Yeah. But, and I, I, I actually find them really good because they're intellectual. They, they, they report stories nobody else reports on. They're biased. They're obviously biased. I've now got a bias radar, and I correct for the bias whenever it comes across. But I read the New York Times, and, and the New York Times is all biased. And you can read it, and you can adjust for everything, and it's sickening because it really – but then you go, okay, so what do I read? You know, where can I get any kind of information? Not a bright bot, <laughs> right? And, and, and so there's, there is no – objective reporting out there. There's no, and it hasn't been for a long time. I mean, this is a scary thing, is this is not new. This is just being discovered, I think, by some people. But it's, yeah. it's the, 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 the bias on the left as being around, I mean, you, you guys don't remember, but when Ronald Reagan ran for president, there were only three networks. There was no other television news, the ABC, NBC, and there was no internet. So the only news you could get, the only news you could get was ABC, NBC, and CBS, and PBS, right? And they were radically anti-Reagan. I mean, they would make, you think they're making fun of Trump, they would make fun of Reagan constantly, right? And there was no alternative. This was all there was. And Reagan's like a giant as compared to Trump, right? So, so in some sense, it's even more biased. So I actually think we're better, in some ways better today, because I think this bias has been going on for a long time. And today, there's at least voices that recognize the bias and are talking about the bias. So in that sense, I think actually the, the media landscape is better because we have an internet, because your show, people actually discuss ideas, and there's, there's the, and, and hundreds, you know, more people watch your show than, than many of the network stuff. So, you know, we're actually blessed today in the fact that technology has made it possible for us to broaden our horizons in ways that didn't exist 20 years ago, 10 years ago. Yeah, if you guys want a little more on this, I'm sure some of you saw it already, but uh, the, I believe the second time I had Eric Weinstein on, he talks about the four types of news, and uh, four types of fake news. Yeah. And one of, the, one of them is that he says, you know, it's not just what they're saying that can often be fake, but it's what they won't say. So for oh. example, when he, it happened to be his brother, Brett Weinstein at Evergreen College, I'm sure many of you guys are all nodding already, so you know the story, and I'm sure everyone at home knows the story. Uh, Brett, a guy who had fought racism his whole life at Evergreen, a, a, perhaps the most left college in all of America, he said that, no, we can't tell students not to come to class one day because of the color of their skin. He was actually fighting racism. The Times did not report on that for weeks and months, and yet at one point had written two or three op-eds about it. So they didn't want it to be in their news section, but then they could offer it a very tepid defense from a sort of liberal op-ed position. And that also is a type of fake news if they just sort of ignore one position. But, you know, but just to, just to be, you know, just because we haven't touched on any controversial issues, I mean, just think about the Middle East, right? If Israel, in, in some context, shoots a Palestinian, that's front page news all over the world. Um, if Egypt bombs what they call terrorists in the Sinai and they kill hundreds of people, it doesn't make a single news agency. Nobody knows that Egypt has been bombing the hell out of the Sinai for the last two years trying to eradicate ISIS from there. Put, it, put aside whether it's just or not. The very fact that they're doing it, nobody cares, nobody reports it. It's completely silent. Mm -hmm. And there's so much of that going on in the world. We only know, we only hear about a tiny little sliver of what's going on. And, you know, one of the things I think, uh, Stephen Pinker, again, if we can end, maybe we can yeah. end on Stephen. One of the things he points out is we never hear about the good stuff. All the good news, like I, I say in my talks, probably the most important news story of the last 30 years, right, that nobody talks about is the fact that over the last 30 years, a billion people have come out of poverty in the world. Because, by the way, of capitalism. <laughs> and New York, Times, New York Times doesn't report that. I mean, all the graphs that he has in that book should be front page. That's the most interesting, important stuff going on in the world. The eradication of hunger, the eradication of extreme poverty through market forces. And nobody reports that, but we hear every little thing, like every, you know, violence is at an all-time low in the United States right now, right? 
but every little murder, particularly if it's committed by a illegal a, a, you know, immigrant, it is reported on immediately. Right? Again, depending on the media source, who reports and who doesn't. And that is so tragic because we don't actually have an objective view of the state of the world or what's going on in the world or what are the real dangers. How many people report about free speech issues? Right? How, the New York Times doesn't yeah. cover that. Well, the guys that do seem to be Salon and Vox and, yeah, and the yeah. rest of that market. <laughs> uh, all right, that, seemed, that seems like a fitting ending. I, I would say this just to, to put a cap on it, which is that it's up to you guys. Like the yeah. pressure is truly on you guys. You know, like you guys live, you're going to college in a incredibly unique time right now. These issues, I mean, I was smoking pot and playing Sega Genesis for four <laughs> years <laughs> in college. I wish in a weird way. I wish I had paid more attention. And I miss for, out but on I was all a political that. science major, so that. you were before pot, I guess. <laughs> um, yes. but, but you guys are truly at, at, at school at an incredibly unique time because the things that you're thinking about are the exact same things that everyone, your parents, your grandparents, everyone you know, everything is up in the air right now. And you guys truly, I, I'm not saying this to pander, like I would not do what I do if I didn't think that there was a chance we could correct this thing. But the only way that guys like us can be a little part of the correction is if we have more people like you. So I thank you guys for yep. coming out. Give a big round of applause to for the you. people at home for watching. <laughs> and let's do some Q&A. you guys view um, like the issue with the Civil Rights Act of 64, could you like, agree with like, you know, it should have been done that the government shouldn't be discriminating, but private businesses and, you know, people have the right to do that. But it's just, you know, the government really. Because if you go to DMV or you go wherever you yeah. need the government, you know, to do yeah. those things, if, you know, if they discriminate against you, you can't really do anything about it, obviously. But, you know, if it's anything private, you know, then that should be up to the business owners. Well, I know your answer on this, yep. so I'll, I'll let you field it, but I think we're in complete agreement. Yeah, I mean, my view is government should absolutely not discriminate. I think the government's job, to go back to my opening statement, is to protect individual rights. The individual rights of every human being. We're all equal in our right to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. And you don't, you, you don't protect rights by violating some people's rights. You can't do that. So government, no. Now, I will challenge one thing. I don't think the government needs to do the DMV. I don't think the government needs to do 90% of what it does today. So we can, we can privatize all that. Uh, but, but yes, government should never discriminate. That is a real evil that needs to be fought. We weren't going to do a whole Ayn Rand uh, event without someone saying, get rid of the DMV, were we? <laughs> no. There, there was no. pretty I, much I mean, no it, It's a key feature of yeah. philosophy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I um, am an anarcho-capitalist, but my question is fairly easy, I would hope so, for Mr. Yaron Burke. Who is John Dalton? <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, anybody who takes his own life seriously, anybody who uses reason to guide their life, to make their life the best life that it can be, and rejects the altruistic guilt and the, the, the unreason that dominates our culture can be a John Gold. That would have been pretty hilarious if he would have been like, uh, who? who? Who are you talking about? <laughs> Good evening. Uh, my question is for Dr. Brooke. So regarding, uh, you said that you support Twitter's right to uh, ban accounts regarding yep. the, the speech yep. issue. So, uh, and I'm guessing as an objectivist, you support um, having as many private businesses as possible as opposed to public yep. areas, is that correct? So if, given those two conditions, wouldn't that mean that speech would always be a, it wouldn't be free speech, but business person um, authorized speech? It, no, because, I mean, in a, in a sense, yes, there's a sense in which that's true. But look, free speech is a limitation on government. The First Amendment is a limitation on government because it's a limitation on force. <laughs> um, you, have a, you have the ability to, to, to use your home, and particularly today, right? I mean, again, 
modern technology has made so many of these issues kind of bogus. I can sit in my computer and, and generate videos on a multiple platform ignoring YouTube. I can, I can probably start my own platform. I mean, probably people here who could help me program that and get it out there. So as long as it's a, a private business is not restricting your speech. A private business is determining what it allows down on its private property, and that's its right. So it's not business granted speech. It's, you know, your speech is up to you, and, and it's your responsibility to find the delivery mechanism for it. You know, in, uh, the, there was in the old days the idea of uh, equal time on, uh, on uh, radio and TV. I forget the name of the... Um, the Fairness Act. The Fairness Act. Yeah. And the idea was all stations... I mean, and Ayn Rand actually supported that as a counter to, all, you know, the bias that existed that, that she... So, but, you know, how many opinions uh, uh, is that, does that respect, right? What is the Fairness Act? So I'm an objectivist. Do, do, I get, do I get equal time with, with a leftist or with a communist or with a, where do I, how do you even do that? It's mm -hmm. impossible to actually allocate time if, you know, in that kind of sense. And no, this is something where the government has no role in. The, the role of the government is to protect you from somebody literally silencing you on your property. And the, the main reason why the First Amendment exists is because throughout history, government has silenced people. And, and in Europe right now, I mean, we talk about the U.S., but Europe is in a much worse situation than the U.S. You saw that in the U.K., but Europe generally, because they have hate speech laws. And you know the massacre in Charlie Hebdo when they went and killed all the cartoonists? Well, the French government was trying to shut down Charlie Hebdo just the weeks before that because Charlie Hebdo was offensive to all these things, religion and everything else, right? And the French government was trying to do it. So... Uh, the French government, in that sense, were allied with the, with the, you know, the Islamists. Right? And so that's the real danger is when, when, when not only will the French government not protect the cartoonists from the Islamists, but when the French government itself is trying to shut down the, the, the cartoon shop. Yeah, very quickly, on, on the Google Twitter front of this, there's interesting arguments to be made because Google particularly controls so much of our information right now. I, I fall more in line with what you're on saying, but I think you guys, I mean, get Turning Point right behind me, get, get them to invite Dennis Prager here to talk about that, because he also comes from a libertarian perspective, conservative perspective. Oh, well, we should do a debate. But obviously has a difference. I'll or, debate or, Prager we'll, on that right, issue we'll, happily. I, I, I will set and, it up. And, I will set it up. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll set it up. We'll set it up. And, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Hi. Um, first of all, first off, I just wanted to say I'm a huge Ayn Rand fan, um, and this is a bit of an abstract question. I want to say, um, so I completely believe in the power of the individual, um, but I think it's also inevitable that culture itself is collectivist, um, especially in the modern world. Like you see, like all these like groups on campus and everything that are just so identity politics based. Um, so um, I, I don't think it's always been that way. So I just wanted to ask about um, your perspectives on how it became that way, how individualism um, has become so antagonized and why that's such like an evil thought in like the present day, especially amongst young people? That's a great question. Yeah. I mean, well, well, let's both take a stab. Yeah. Quickly, I, I would say this, it's simply lazy thinking. Yeah. That is the easiest and most honest answer. It is lazy thinking to, to look at you and you have brown skin. What can I discern from you from that? Other than your skin color. Absolutely, you like curry. <laughs> okay, you like curry. I like Indian food. There you go. All right, we can go for dinner after this. But, but really, if I was to look at you and think, think that I know anything else about you other than that right now, right? You're, you're a woman, you have long hair. I mean, the, the things that I can see, those are the things that you can tell by looking at somebody. But to think that you know more about somebody because of that, if, right, if I was taking the leftist view of this, I'd look at you and go, oh, well, she's brown skinned, so she must be a progressive, and she, you know, and blah, 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 blah. That is actually prejudice. That is prejudging. That is the essence of, what, of what, where racism and xenophobia comes from. So this whole thing that we're fighting is based in lazy thinking. 
if you actually care about people, if you care to sit down across from somebody and look them in the eye as I'm doing with you now, you will learn a lot more about people and you will have all of your, uh, pr your, your, uh, your own prejudices will melt pretty quickly. And it's actually the antidote to racism to believe in the individual. Uh, that's so, my feeling. So, I mean, I, I agree with all of that, but let me, let me, I think it's important for us to realize, because I think we take certain things for granted. Individualism is a huge achievement. It's an achievement. It's an ideological achievement. So the human race has been collectivistic for, for however long you want to count the human race as being around, right? We were tribal. We hated the other tribe. You know, uh, uh, Jews hated everybody else. Everybody else hated Jews. I mean, this is the way it's been forever. And then these thinkers came about during the Enlightenment, right? And they said, no, all of that is wrong because all of that is based basically on emotion. It's lazy thinking. It's non-thinking, really. No, we all have this capacity to reason. We all have this capacity to think as individuals. We can't eat as a group. We don't have a collective stomach. We certainly don't have a collective brain. And for the first time in human history, really, during the 18th century, and even they were flawed because they still had, uh, had, had slavery, these thinkers came up and said, no, individuals are the, 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 the moral unit, the sacred unit, the thing that is most important, because they can think for themselves. They can use their own reason to judge and evaluate the world. Yeah, remember, before that, we, you know, all of human history is tribal, authoritarian, you know, dictatorship, uh, which God do you believe in, that dictated everything. So for the first time this period, and I think, I think it's never gotten a full defense, this idea of individualism, and it's never been grounded. And what has happened is that knowledge that came about in the Enlightenment, the, the, for a start, the adoration of reason and the, the understanding of reason's role in human life, has slowly been eroded, primarily by German philosophers and the German romantic tradition and so on. And when we abandon reason, when we abandon thinking, the default is tribalism. The default is collectivism. So you have to think about it. That's the default. Individualism is an achievement. And what we need is to resurrect the ideas of the Enlightenment. This is why I love Pinker's book, right? Even if I don't agree with everything in it. The idea that the Enlightenment is what we should aspire towards is the right idea. We can, we can argue about the details later, but it's the idea of individual reason and the efficacy of reason and the importance of reason. That's the battle. It's not political. That's why I can, I can love Steven Pinker, in spite of the fact that politically he probably votes for something completely different than me. But it's the adoration of reason and the enlightenment. That's what it's about. And we have to recognize that there's an achievement because otherwise we get lazy. Oh, individualism. Well, that's easy, right? No. I mean, it took 100,000 years of human history to come up with the idea of individualism. And, and it's too easily dismissed, and we need to fight for it. That's the real battle. Thank you. Hi, David, big fan. Hi. Uh, just wanted to say, again, on a side note, I would love to see you interview Ravi at Zacharias. That would be it's, it's in the works. We've, but, we're talking to his people. Great. But, yeah. uh, my question is for Mr. Brooke, um, and it's about <coughs> health care as a right. And I've been certainly wrestling with the subject. Um, the counter argument, of course, <coughs> is that um, to make health care a right requires the coercion of either directly of the health care provider or indirectly of the taxpayer. And therefore, it is tantamount to slavery, and that one cannot um, have a right to enslave. That to exercise a right, if you must, if you have to infringe upon somebody else's right to do it, it can't be a right. Well, I'm very sympathetic to that particular <laughs> counter argument. But what the the uh, speed bump that I'm running into as I think through this, because I don't like to talk sure. points, I like to sure. think things through. Uh, our current legal system guarantees one the right to an attorney if they're accused of a crime and also right to trial by jury, both of which would then coerce the, at, at very least, the time and labor of another. So my question is, what am I missing? Is it mislabeled as a right? Is it a different kind of right? And how is it fundamentally different than the alleged right to health care? Wow. That right there is a guy who knows wow. how to ask a question. Wow. That, I mean, that, that, that was a beautiful question. You, 
And not only is it a beautiful question, I've never heard it before. Yeah. And and it was it was really well formulated. And you laid and out I think, the questions on and both I haven't even computer. and I haven't thought about it in that context. So it's 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 a new thing for me to think about. I I I I think first of all that we have to rethink about the whole idea of a right. You know, the whole idea of a jury. I'm not convinced of that. That is truly a right. And and uh, you know, just because just because somebody said a long time ago that something's a right doesn't make it a right. I think thinking through exactly the way you prescribed it, one has the question, is that a real, is it a right in that sense? Um, but, you know, if you accept that, right, then if you accept the right, the jury is the same kind of coercive activity, um, then you, know, you have a right to food and you have, a right, you have all the positive rights and, that, and, and everything collapses. And I think you have to question, and I don't have an answer for you, right, at the end of the day, I'm happy to say I don't know because I haven't really thought about it. You, you have to question whether you would categorize the right to a jury and the right to a, a publicly paid attorney um, as, as real rights. And what would be the alternative? And how, you know, you have a right to be treated justly, right? That you have a right to. And what does justice require? And justice can't require the coercion of other people. So one has to think through, and it would have, would, would, one would have to solve that problem. But I wouldn't use that to undercut everything else. I would just say there's an issue there to think about, and there's an issue there to solve. Not that gives me now the right to coerce everybody into doing whatever the hell I want in the name of rights. No, you, you don't empty the concept of rights just because there's a, not a clear understanding of how to apply it to a particular area. And, and clearly, I don't have... I wish one of my philosopher friends were here, philosophers of law, to, and on how, that, how the issue of rights applies to the jury and the other issue. But again, don't be tempted by something you don't know and don't know exactly how to apply by throwing up the whole concept, uh, which is what, if you apply the right to health care, then rights don't mean anything. Then, you, you, you then forget about rights. And right. did you ever get a chance to ask Spencer Perry that question? I'd love to hear his response <laughs> as a lawyer as well. Okay. All right, we're, we'll try to be a little more brief because there's so many yeah. of you. Yeah. My question is for Dave, and just a disclaimer, I'm on the left, but I support free speech. Great. My um, question is about Russiagate because I'm on the left, and a lot of Democrats have been using that to silence my voice. They think like Bernie Sanders is a Russian agent. Jill Stein is a Russian agent who is behind the Black Lives Matter. Yeah. It's starting to remind me of when like Alex Jones would talk about how Soros is behind everything. <laughs> well, that one's true. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> well, I, would never, I never thought I would see it from liberals and Democrats. And I just want to let you guys know, like, Democrats shut down leftist voices as well. It's not just those on the right. Yeah. yeah. I just want to see what your opinion about the whole Russia thing is. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your question because I am someone that comes from the left, right? I mean, I was a progressive basically my whole life. I worked at the Young Turks. I mean, I, I understand what that thinking is. And I'm sure most of you guys you know, know my, my basic story, but I started seeing an absolute collapse of, of thinking, of, of intellectualism, of honest brokering, of, of basically not always assuming the worst motives of all of your opponents, but actually thinking, you know, these people might just think differently and we got to sit down with them. Uh, so without going too far down the rabbit hole of Russiagate, what I would say is if, if you are struggling to uh, debate properly on facts, you will go down every rabbit hole there is. And I think that unfortunately there's a lot of, these days especially because of the way we get news, <coughs> there's a lot of rabbit holes to go down. And uh, that's just one of the many that people are traveling down these days. But Once facts out, everything is open. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because imagination is limitless. Uh, uh, good evening, uh, first sergeant, uh, fellow first sergeant U.S. Army. But, uh, Thank you. My question is, towards the end of what we covered, as a libertarian, um, recently the budget that was passed included a seventy billion dollar increase in defense, which is greater than the entire budget for the Russian military. Right, so uh, it'll take them a decade to spend as much as we're going to spend this year. And once you give it to them, it's never taken back, okay? And that story was not covered in the press at all, okay? So a $70 billion increase 
And as a libertarian, you know, uh, uh, that's one, is how can you justify giving that amount of money for defense? And I know defense is important, right? But the other question is, is uh, how come YouTubers and other sources of media are not covering that story? We're gonna, uh, it has come to the point where DOD has said that our budget deficit is an existential crisis. Yeah, well, first off, thank you for your service. Um, I would say quickly on that, that uh, I, I tweeted out that day. I mean, if you're a libertarian or a classical liberal, of course you should be disappointed by Trump signing this thing. And of course, I mean, government, all the government does is make big budgets so that it can reach those budgets, so it can spend that money, so that it can get more money. The only way we can push back on this, I mean, people thought that Trump was going to somehow magically come in and, and not do that. And it's exactly what he's done. So if you really want limited government, you have to stop voting for people that believe that government the answer. I think Trump kind of tricked people a little bit on this, uh, but you should vote for more people like Austin Peterson, who's running for Senate in Missouri. Uh, yeah, I love Austin. I mean, that, that's the only thing you can do. I, I, very quickly, on the YouTuber part, I, you know, I don't think there's some sort of grand conspiracy. I mean, I'll, I'll certainly talk about it more on my show. I would have loved to have seen something that would have been a 20, I, I mean, just naming a number, a 20% cut across the board on everything. Guess what? The government will still function, you know? And if the post office closes tomorrow, I'm pretty sure Amazon could figure it out. So there's, but, but everyone's afraid to say, well, we're gonna have to do some of that stuff and let's see what happens. And I think your own would say that the private sector could step in in almost every case. Yeah, in, in almost everything except the military because I think that is a function, a legitimate function of government. And I do talk about the fact that our military budget as is, is way overblown. If we actually let the military win wars uh, instead of building so-called, you know, building societies, building democracies. And we've got troops in 120 different countries. Not 120 different countries are not a threat to the United States. Very few are indeed, given the size of our military. No, we should be shrinking military spending, but coalescing it about really defending America, bringing troops home and really actually, you know, I'm a hawk when it comes to, 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 to the military. And, and this is the thing that, that Trump supposedly signed the budget because he's so pro-military and, and so he, you know, he let them spend all this other stuff. So, but no, even on the military, you shouldn't be spending this money. I, I agree with you completely. And I do talk about it. I think generally, I don't find a lot of YouTube, unfortunately, on, on the more economic issues. There's a lot on the social issues on, on free speech, which is great, because I do think free speech is the most important issue. There's just not a lot on the economic issues. I think there's a lot of lack of understanding of the economic issues. Thank you. We have about 15 more minutes of question and answer. All right, well, we're going to try to do one minute answers. We'll okay. try to get to everybody. Hi, guys. It's so great right. to have you here at UCF. Thank you guys so much for coming. Sure. Um, you guys mentioned journalism and you mentioned Silicon Valley, but you didn't mention the Hollywood. And I'm a film major. I'm about to graduate, enter the abyss of death and destruction before me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to graduate, so. Yeah. But I wanted to know your advice on on that. In, in, in particular, I'm looking at jobs at CNN, unfortunately, because that's the closest thing to me. Um, do you advise staying silent and just going under the radar and continuing <clears throat> into my, the film industry as I am, or being more vocal about it and being a little bit braver and trying to affect some change? I'm, just, I'm so like, yeah. stuck between both, both ends. Well, I'm pretty sure you just lost the job at CNN by doing this on my <laughs> channel, but okay, forget that. I, I would say don't worry about them. They are a dying dinosaur. We are watching them sink into the La Brea tar pits right now. Get on YouTube, get a, I mean, I'm some guy that started a YouTube channel, that's it, right? You all can do that. Open a Twitter, I mean, all that stuff. Get on there, start making great films, put it out there, tweet at me. If it's good, I'll retweet you. I mean, that's really it. You don't need them anymore, they're dying. Let's let them die and figure out what comes next. And don't, and believe me, at how old are you, 19 maybe? 22. You're 22. If you're going to compromise at 22, you will compromise way more at 33 and 44 and 55. So why would you compromise now? Just get out there and do it. I don't think you can beat that answer. All right. So uh, with free market, there tends to be some sort of uh, compulsion in the grand scale of focusing on capital gains as opposed to potentially positive social movements. For example, mass media covering like the bad news as opposed to the good news. Um, in terms of YouTube kind of censoring the stuff that may cause worry, is there a way for the free market to practically solve that? Or is it just kind of an issue of 
there are alternatives such as Vimeo, but they tend not to be as effective as YouTube. So is there a free market way to address such an issue? Yeah, I mean, I, I think if things get bad enough on YouTube, then alternatives will arise. I, I think that the people with money right now are trying to think up of ways to, 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 to fix it. Uh, I, think, I think as long as human beings want more negative news than positive news, they'll be provided with more negative news than positive news. The market is not there to fix our cognition and to fix our desires. It's not there to fix in that sense. Now, we can advocate for fixing if we change this audience and the audience wants really good news, the media will provide that. So um, you can't expect the marketplace to fix social problems, although I think it does. You, you know, I think discrimination and stuff like that can be fixed by the market. But ultimately, it has to be an intellectual force. So the fact that I'm for free markets doesn't mean I think free markets are everything, right? I still think that they're gonna be people like us advocating and speaking and arguing about issues because I think, I think intellectuals shape the culture. I think they dominate the culture. And, uh, you know, they function within a free market, but that is not, you know, I don't know that J John Locke would have been the best paid public speaker in the world. Yes, he was the most influential thinker of the Enlightenment. So it, it doesn't exactly call it. I mean, I think Ayn Rand was the most important thinker of the 20th century. Nobody would know, nobody thinks that except me. So, you know, I'm, I talk about that, I advocate for that. Uh, you know, hopefully, over time, I'll build a market for that. But it, it takes time, it, you know, these things take time. Yeah, we'll see how quick we can do as many of these as possible. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, earlier, you guys talked about boycotting the different social media, such as Facebook, YouTube. <laughs> um, so when things are that big, there's, right now, there isn't really a whole lot of competitors for them. Um, and also, uh, on top of that, if a lot of conservatives start boycotting these, wouldn't it just create more of a bubble where conservatives are in their own bubble and liberals are in their own bubble? And then we never get to talk, we never get to talk uh, to each other via social media. Yeah. Uh, we don't get to have a discussion anymore. And then on top of that, you know, I don't exactly know where you would go with something as big as Google. <coughs> they exist, but when people talk about Bing, they don't say they're going to Bing something. They say they're going to Google something on Bing. You know? <laughs> right. So, uh, so what, do you, what do you think is a, an answer to that other than boycotting? I mean, there's a couple of things there. First, I think you're right. that if all, And you see this sometimes in the, the new conservative free speech site, you know, or, or social media thing. Yes, there's a risk there. If all the conservatives leave and then Twitter remains and it's all lefties, there, there's a problem there. What I would say, and, and Yaron just alluded to this, there are, I, I can't get into all the specifics, but there are major discussions happening with big time money people in Silicon Valley right now trying to solve this problem. So if you feel that you don't want Facebook to have all your information or you, don't, or you think Twitter's shadow banning people or you're not happy with YouTube videos not going out to feeds, <coughs> then use those sites or don't use those sites. But in the meantime, I, we're just in complete agreement that the market is what has to solve it. And it's just gonna be a little messy. So that the things that you're worried about probably will kind of happen, but eventually I think it'll, it'll present itself. I'll just say this quickly. Life did exist before Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> there was MySpace. Uh, <laughs> that that just shows the difference in age. Yeah, yeah. There's an era even before MySpace. But it yeah. was Friendster. Yeah, Friendster. <laughs> Wow, you guys got Prince to reference. Wow, all right, that was pretty good. Okay, Go great. Um, I'm the chapter leader of Citizens Climate Lobby here in Orlando, and I've heard both of you speak about climate change. I have a question about that. Well-defined property rights are the foundation of market forces, and the market allocates resources efficiently to some of these market forces. What about when property, right, property rights are not well-defined, like in the atmosphere, which we're allowed to use like a free gun? Um, how could the market, or what should the government do to make the market correct that problem? I'll just give a one-liner on this. I just did a show that we shot last week. It'll be up next week about some conservative solutions to environment, so definitely check that out. Uh, but I'll let you answer that. I mean, I would say that nothing. The government should do nothing about it. And if it's a real problem, then again, education is important. Let's, let's educate people about that. People will change their behavior if they really think there's a danger and they really think there's a threat. I think the problem with the climate change debate is primarily the solution being offered. The solution being offered, don't use carbon fuels, is a non-solution. It's a non-starter. It's stupid. It means death and destruction. 
you know, if, if, if there really is a problem, and, and I, get, I usually take a neutral stand, I'm not a scientist, I don't want to get into that debate, if there really is an issue, let's be creative about finding solutions to it. Suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. You know, spray something into the atmosphere that, that dissolves the CO2. I don't know, I'm, right? But it can't be what I know because, because I'm alive. You cannot ban fossil fuels. That is, a, that is, a, that is a, an anti-life answer. And as long as that's the answer the, 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 the environmentalists present, then forget about it. They, you know, they can win, but their winning means the destruction of civilization as we know. Uh, yeah, we gotta, we gotta move. Thank you, though. Thanks. Yes. But, uh, my question is for um, Jerome Brooks. I know you're a former IDF, yeah. um, and um, I also have been to Israel. And I noticed that open carrying <coughs> is not is very common over there, um, and even the fact that that guns are not prohibited in schools in Israel, and you don't really, I don't hear any news of mass shootings, mass school shootings in Israel. And so I want to know what your perspective on, is on not arming every teacher, but those teachers that are experienced um, with firearms in order to have the right yeah, I mean, people carry openly in Israel if they're really, really well trained. So you don't, Israel is not, does not have liberal gun laws for just everybody. If you, you know, but then everybody goes through the army. But even going through the army doesn't guarantee that you're well trained. Those people who are really well trained are the ones who you see open carry. And of course in Israel you see security guards everywhere because there's security guards everywhere. Um, look, I think the school shooting debate, we're having the wrong debate. I don't think school shooting is about guns. School shooting is about why young, me, young kids in this country between the ages of 14 and 17, why so many of them are so angry, are so nihilistic, are so hateful that they would go into a school and want to hurt their fellow students. Not into the mall, not to a stadium somewhere, but into a school. Now this to me suggests something wrong with our schools. So I think we need a debate in this country about education policy. About, about what government schools are doing to our kids, why there's so much nihilism. And partially, I think this relates to Antifa and relates to the violence that's out there. There is a real nihilistic street, Jordan Peterson talks about this a lot, in our young people, in your generation. Why? I think it's because of the educational system. I think it's because of government schools. And I think our government schools are training young nihilists, they're causing people to become nihilistic. That's the problem. That's what needs to be dealt with. That's what needs to be challenged. And yes, short term, if you want to put a security guard there, if you want to arm a teacher, if they're well trained, if they know how to use, sure, I don't have any problem with that, right? But I don't think that's a long term solution. The long term, and, and the thing nobody wants to talk about, why are these kids so angry at their school? I mean, think about the mentality of wanting to kill everybody, not a bully. I can understand a kid being bullied and taking a gun and wanting to shoot the bully. No. Everybody. And, you know, the Columbine kids wanted to blow up the school and kill 2,000 people. They, they had bombs. They didn't work, luckily. Right? The bombs didn't work. And it's not about guns, right? If they don't have guns, I'll have bombs. So it's about education. And I, what I want to have is a real discussion about progressive education, about government schools, about where the school should be privatized, about all of that. That, to me, is a thousand times more important an issue than guns. Guns is not an important one way or the other in my view. Now, I know a lot of people disagree with me on this, but one way or the other, I don't think guns matter. If they, took, if they took all our guns, it doesn't matter, and if we kept all the guns, it doesn't matter that much. What matters a thousand times more is what's happening in our schools. All right, we're gonna try. So I have a question concerning the United States healthcare system. Just make it short. I have the knowledge that you know the United States uh, spends more money than any other yeah. country in the yeah. Western yeah. Hemisphere uh, yeah. on healthcare. So how would you would you advocate a more you know like Germany for instance, who has got a uh, dual? No. So let me cut, let me cut you off because we're going to make this short, right? I advocate for complete privatization of healthcare, hundred percent. But let me let me add this: I don't care how much money is spent on healthcare. Like, I have spent a lot of money on, on like MRIs and CAT scans just to make sure I wasn't gonna die. Now, 
in the column of wasted money, that counts as wasted because they didn't find anything. Cool. I mean, I view that as a positive. <laughs> but if, you're, if, you, if you look at aggregate numbers, then we spend a huge amount of money. Yes, because we spend a huge amount. Now, what is the right number to spend on healthcare? Who gets to decide? The reason I want it privatized, the reason I want it privatized is so you can decide. So I don't decide for you. So we as a group don't vote to decide how much to spend on his health care. I want every individual to decide how much is appropriate. Some people will spend a huge amount. They'll get MRI every year. They'll check, and some people will say, I, I don't want to spend that much. I'm going to spend less. And if you had real free health care, free market health care, you'd have a variety of different insurance policies and a variety of different options that would be that would categorize your preferences rather than social preferences.
And I think that's true of, of a number, quite a few people on, on the right. Uh, so I'm, I'm less positive generally about the right than, uh, than Dave is, but uh, because I, 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 I've seen that intolerance, at least towards me and my, you know, people who, who agree with me. And I also worry, and this is, again, part of my perspective of the right, I worry that the right gets associated with religion, right? And, and to me, you know, I'm an atheist, and I, think it's, and I don't think atheism is irrelevant to the discussion. I think it's, I'm like, I'm more on Sam Harris's side on this issue. I think atheism, this question of religion is an important question. I think it needs to be resolved. I, ultimately, I think for Western civilization to, to exist, we need to have that conversation, and I think we will win. Um, so I, I, think, I think I worry about the dominance of religion in the Republican Party. I worry about the dominance of religion on, on the so-called right. And I do see some intolerance on that side to uh, not just to the atheism, but the, 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 the kind of atheism that I bring, I think, you know, maybe a more strident uh, perspective on, on these kind of issues. Um, and, you know, and, and, and I take the abortion series, the issue seriously, and I probably disagree with many of you on abortion, and I'm with Dave on abortion, and, 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 and there's a number of these other issues that I think where we really do clash and there really is an issue. Um, ben Shapiro it, it seems to be an exception to that. He's really open to discussion and debating and, and having a conversation about it. We'll, but we'll see where all of this goes. I think this is fascinating, what Dave has managed to do, and, and I really give credit to Dave here is he really has, through his interviews and through the network that he's created, he's created kind of, an, um, um, in a sense, an umbrella of people who are interested in debating serious ideas and having real conversations about deep issues. And it's to Dave's credit that this is all coming, because I don't think it would have happened by itself. Somebody has to be kind of the, the facilitator and, you know, Dave's saying to somebody, you know, these Iron Man guys are not that bad. And, <laughs> you know, and, and, and uh, you know, hey, Ben Shapiro is a nice guy. And, and all of this, I think somebody has to be the mediator. But having that conversation, I think, is so crucial to, you know, our, our uh, progress towards more freedom and more liberty and more conversation and more free speech. Uh, so so I, I celebrate what Dave has done, even if I disagree with with a lot of the people there on a lot of the issues, I think having that conversation is so crucial. And for you, right, to be exposed to these conversations. I mean, um, for the last 20 years, there's been no television worth watching of any intellectual content. You now have the best interviewer of his generation actually creating great intellectual content. I mean, it's amazing. He actually right, well, blushed. He I'll, actually yeah, blushed. That I'm a good. little young for a Lifetime Achievement <laughs> Award, but, but you guys are an incredible piece yep. of, of everything that yep. Yaron just said. Uh, so I thank you guys for coming out and defending free speech and open inquiry and critical thinking and all that good stuff. Uh, we have a dinner to go to right after this, but we'll hang out and, and say hi to a couple of you guys. And I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. And now make some noise for the people at home so that they know you guys are all here. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you. Cool.